one up there. I'm not sure you can read that. That's great, that is. Six it is. Six after six. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good evening. Good evening, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at uh, this um, Your Manchester Insights event, um, the first one of 2018, Climate Change Challenges, Consequences, Actions. Uh, my name is Andrew Young, and I'm Senior Development Officer here within the Division of Development and Alumni Relations. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, I just want to mention some housekeeping. Uh, we're not anticipating a fire alarm, so if the fire alarm sounds, please leave by the nearest fire exit and outside and await further instructions. Um, please could you turn your phones onto silent. Uh, we also have members of the audience who are live tweeting this evening, and the hashtag is hashtag UIM Insights, so please do take part. Um, so, our university is home to world-leading academics who are helping to create climate, to tackle climate change, not create climate change. Um, <laughs> tonight we will hear from two of the university's foremost experts on climate change about the challenges we face, the consequences if we don't rise to them, and the surprising pioneers in international action. And just to say, there should be time at the end of the talks for you to ask questions to both speakers. Climate change research at the University of Manchester falls under the remit of Tyndall Manchester, where Professor Kevin Anderson is Deputy Director. Tyndall Manchester undertakes world-class research delivering agenda-setting insights on energy and climate change. It brings together a vibrant and committed community of scientists, engineers, social scientists and economists providing considerable and diverse academic expertise on all aspects of energy and climate change. Tyndall Manchester researchers are regularly invited to contribute to high-level policy debates locally and globally. For example, our insights led to the UK becoming the first country in the world to introduce cumulative carbon budgets into legislation. The University of Manchester has also been at the forefront of development studies for over 60 years. The Global Development Institute, which is the largest development-focused teaching and research institute in Europe, and is led jointly by Professor David Hume and Professor Diana Mitlin, addresses global inequalities in order to promote a socially just world in which all people, including future generations, are able to enjoy a decent life. Their findings have shaped development policy, influenced national governments, and informed practice in several countries such as the implementation of a pilot anti-poverty transfer program in Uganda and in collaboration with the University of Zimbabwe, our reports on poverty and well-being impacted national policy and budget allocations for reform. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to our first speaker this evening, Professor Kevin Anderson, who will start our discussions. Thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me with the microphone? Is that, is that fine? Yes. Can anyone not hear me? Okay. Um, right, this is going to be quite a sort of whistle-stop tour, and I'm going to go through the slides quite quickly, but it's the, sort of, it's the flow of the message that matters as much as the detail. You're very welcome to have the slides later, or you can ask me about the detail later on, but it's the sort of, it's the, sort of the flow of the narrative about taking us from setting an initial context around climate change, then providing some sort of quantitative work in the middle, and then back to sort of a final context about what we might do about it. So I've called it beyond appeasement, mitigation as if climate mattered, and I would argue at the moment that we don't think it does, including the climate scientists. Um, and, oh, and if you are tweeting, I have a Twitter account as well. So you can put your criticisms up there. I'm going to start off with a quote here from uh, Richard Feynman, um, who wrote about climate change a long time ago when he was the chair of the President's Commission um, into the Challenger shuttle incident. And obviously those of you who are aware of Feynman know that he wasn't writing about climate change, but um, about the, about the um, space shuttle accident. But I think what he said was really important. For a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And what we are trying to do on climate change and have done for the last 20-odd years is fool nature, and we're going to carry on doing it at the moment. 
So I'll come back to that later. But then at the other end of the sort of disciplinary spectrum, here's a message from the Pope. And the Pope's encyclical on climate change is one of the best publications available. You can, if you want to, you can park the spiritual dimension. That's up to you. But the, it covers really well the social science and the science areas. And he really captures much better than most scientists or analysts what is really at the core of the problem of climate change. I'm just taking this, this part from the encyclical. The alliance of technology and economics ends up sidelining anything unrelated to its immediate interests, which I think is exactly where we are on climate change at the moment. Everything relates to a utopian version of technology and economics. And as, as an engineer who should design and build offshore oil platforms, I think technology has a lot to offer. But nevertheless, I think we're overplaying it. Whereas any genuine attempt to introduce change is viewed as a nuisance based on romantic illusions so when, as soon as we say something that's a bit too challenging, it's unrealistic, not feasible. It, how, how can the politicians deliver that? And we hear this repeatedly about the sorts of scales of change that we require. But what are the real romantic illusions? Well, I think a belief, naive, believe, a belief in naive and ephemeral textbook economics, which dominates our society and our governments, I think is naive and romantic. An unshakable confidence in some sort of technical utopia, most people who believe in sort of technical futures seem to me to have never actually tried to construct one in reality. The deliberate neglect of time, that this is not a problem that can be solved in 2030, but it's a problem we solve this afternoon or this evening and tomorrow. A faith in Machiavellian mathematics, whether that's discount rates or elasticities of demand in economics. And an implicit assumption that nature follows our rules. And I personally think 13 billion years of physics will always trump 30 years of ephemeral economics. Um, so what is the mitigation challenge that we face? And some of you, you probably not many really remember this particular incident, but you're probably familiar with this picture. Um, so the Paris Agreement commits us to zero carbon in our time. So that's what we're aiming at here. Um, and it's also committed us very clearly, and as a democracy, that means all of us are committed to this, to take action to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees centigrade. Notice that it doesn't say 50-50 chance of or a 63% chance of exceeding, which is the government's position, but well below and pursue 1.5, to do so in accordance with the best science and also on the basis of equity. And no country in the world, including the UK, takes any notice of the equity dimension at the moment. And let's also be clear that 2 degrees C is a global average um, with very large regional repercussions, probably 6 degrees or so in the poles. And 2 degrees C is not safe, which is why poor parts of the world ask for 1.5. At 2 degrees C, many people will, will die. They'll be poor... They'll be a long way from here. They'll have almost no role in actually causing the problem, and they'll typically be non-white. But they will die, and we've known that for the last 25 years, when we've known everything we need to do about climate change to act. So we have deliberately carried on our lifestyles, knowing that's the case. So what is our response so far to climate change? Well, I think, and I often get criticised for being sort of quite blunt about that, but I think our job as academics is to do good research and then bluntly communicate it. I don't care whether people like or dislike what I have to say, only whether they agree or disagree. But starting off with an honest position, I think it's not a bad idea. Um, and so I think some humility. The first IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, that's the main body that collects the data together, came out in 1990. In 2016, emissions were 60% higher than they were in 1990 of carbon dioxide. 60%, despite the fact we'd had 26 years by then, over a quarter of a century, Normally, your students, I can say, they weren't born in that time. Some of you probably were. Often, often with the students, I can say, actually, your parents hadn't even met when we had the first IPCC report. So a quarter of a century. And yet, even this last year, emissions went up by 2%. So what we've had is 27 to 28 years of abject failure on climate change by people with no hair, dyed hair, or grey hair. And we have actively chosen to fail. And why have we failed? We've had a litany of technocratic frauds. The language probably is quite strong, but I think it captures it um, accurately. We had offsetting, paying the poor to diet for us. Never very successful. We had the clean development mechanism, which was basically state-sanctioned offsetting so we could build airports and expand shale gas. We had the emissions trading scheme, with so many permits made available that the price of carbon was virtually zero, so it had no impact, but we could pretend we were doing something. And now all of these scams have failed, We're relying on speculative negative emission technologies to suck CO2 out of, the future, out of the air in the future, in other words, the next generation. And when that, no doubt, comes crashing down around us, we're relying on scientific geoengineering to solve the problem, a sticking plaster on gangrene. We've not tried mitigation. We've not tried to reduce our emissions in 27 to 28 years. Maybe a few people here have, but 
Well, by the time you normally ask people to add in aviation, they normally haven't. And even in the UK, supposedly a leading country on this, and certainly in many respects it is, um, if you add aviation and shipping, which we always conveniently ignore, and our imports and exports, then in fact the emissions today in the UK are roughly the same as they were in 1990. No reduction from one of the leading countries on climate change. So let's try and look at what real mitigation might be. Let's see what are the take-home messages from this. Firstly, that delivering on the, on the Paris Agreement, which already is, 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 is not uh, a safe threshold for many parts of the world, is far more challenging than most scientists and politicians will admit, at least when you put a microphone in front of them. We're all too scared of, of, of countering the orthodoxy. Um, real mitigation for 2 degrees centigrade, I think, is just about possible. I don't think it is possible for 1.5, and I'm not going to discuss that today, but I think we've lost the chance for 1.5, so 2 degrees centigrade. Um, Long-term targets, what we do in 2030 or 2050, which has been a language the scientists have repeatedly used, has nothing to do with science and never has had, and scientists should not have been using it. The only thing that matters in terms of temperature is the carbon budgets, so that's the build-up of CO2. So how you got here tonight, having the lights on and the projector on means we're burning oil and coal and gas and so forth, and that CO2 will be in the atmosphere for centuries and some of it will be there for thousands of years changing the climate. So we are changing the climate with this event tonight, so it's the carbon budgets that matter. So let's try and quantify the sort of mitigation challenge a little bit here. Well, these are our emissions historically. You see a little spike there with the fires in Indonesia. You can see September the 11th in there. And before Paris, we were heading somewhere in this general direction to 4 to 6 degrees centigrade of warming, which in a cold night in Manchester sounds quite pleasant. But that's roughly the, you know, the difference between now and an ice age is roughly 5 degrees. So it's that sort of time frame, that sort of level of change that we're talking about occurring in 100 years or so. And um, this sort of thing has never happened in human history anyway. Um, with Paris, then we're probably only aiming for 3 to 4 degrees centigrade of warming if you add up all the promises that every country made in the Paris Agreement. But the main reason we're going there is really because of the banking crisis, not because of any judicious climate change policy. So 3 to 4 degrees centigrade of warming. Um, and we've promised to stay for 2 degrees centigrade of warming. And to stay well below 2 degrees centigrade, the carbon budget that we have, the total amount of carbon dioxide we can dump in the atmosphere across the century, is about 800 billion tonnes. That probably means very little to some of you other than the odd climate change geek amongst you. Um, but we put into the atmosphere about 40 billion tonnes every year. So that probably does mean something to anyone who's got some basic arithmetic. Yeah, 800 divided by, 20, uh, by 40 it gives you 20 years. So we've got about 20 years of current emissions. So if you roll this out, that area under the curve is 800 billion. Then we're talking something like zero carbon by around about 2050-ish. That's at a global level. Now, my argument has been repeatedly to move from here to here. You cannot do that with low carbon supply. You can't build your way out of the problem with power stations, you know, wind, nuclear, solar, whatever it might be. You can't do that fast enough. So in the short term, you have to reduce demand dramatically. There are virtually no scenarios at a global level, even in the UK, that do that. So it's a romantic illusion. We can't possibly question demand because growth goes on forever, infinite, to most economists anyway. So that's the first romantic illusion. But we do, of course, at the same time as reducing demand, we have to make sure we put in place the, the planning and start constructing the low carbon energy supply that needs to be completed in about three decades. And actually, what's wrong there? It's, it's what's said then. It's not low, it's zero. If you want to stabilize the temperature, it's got to be zero carbon energy, not low carbon energy. The other thing we had in Paris is that we've said that the poor parts of the world can have a little bit longer to make this transition. And that's repeated in Paris, the Camp David Agreement, the Copenhagen Accord, or the Kyoto Protocol. We've always had this equity dimension in there, which we've always, of course, only ever paid lip service to. But that's another romantic illusion. Do we really care about the poor elsewhere? I would argue probably not. So this is a fairly sort of stark message that I think just comes straight out of the science and a bit of basic arithmetic. Um, so why is it we saw so many people euphoric in Paris um, chinking their champagne glasses with the stars that flew over there on their private jets. <laughs> so why do we see that sort of thing? And I think it's partly because they've received, and of course have wanted to receive, a very different story, given to them by academics, particularly by a group of modelers called Integrated Assessment Modelers, which is prim primarily economists, with some guidance from engineers and scientists as well. And these modelers basically do their analysis and can offer carbon budgets that are twice as big as those that come out of the science, purely out of the science, with much less mitigation, so much lower reduction rates. The, models, the median level of the models that they produce, so we've got 1,600 billion tonnes. Remember it was 800 before? So if you plot it out, it looks like this. 
And if you're a policymaker, which one would you rather sell to your electorate, the blue line or the red line? If you're an academic, off to another absolutely essential international conference with your friends, um, yeah, which one would you prefer, the red line or the blue line? If you're someone going on holiday, which one would you prefer, the red line? Blue? Yeah, we all like the red line. So policymakers wanted that. We all wanted that. So for a likely chance of two degrees centigrade, we've got the IPCC science saying we've got 800 billion tonnes, which looks a bit challenging, and we've got the economic model saying, don't you worry, you've got 1,600 billion tonnes. So it's, you see, and this is all from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, different working groups, one's the science and one's more the economics. So how is this possible? What, you know, how can you make sense of this? This, <laughs> this is my second most favourite climate change film. It's just wonderful. It's primarily about how we have completely naive views of utopian technology, which is what we do on climate change. So I think this captures climate change really well. And the other film that goes along with it, I think, is a relatively modern one called The Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Reskes and Eric Conway. Both wonderful films in their different ways, very different ways. The other one is actually about climate change. And the reason that we can do this is because we've, we've employed some magicians to pull rabbits out of hats. Um, what we've done, with the, these particular modelers have conjured up, I think it's the right word, they've conjured up negative emission technologies, which sounds quite nice. I mean, it sounds like you can buy them off the shelf. These things don't exist. And these are going to suck out hundreds of billions of tons of carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere out across into the future. And when I say, you know, we've done this, not, we're not going to suck it out. Not people like, well, maybe me, I hope to be here for a bit longer with a bit of stem cell research. But uh, you know, the, we're saying the next generation will have to suck it out of the air. Not us. So we're passing, we want to be on the blue line, uh, we want to be on the red line rather, and we're asking the future generations to get us back to the blue line. So we're passing responsibility on to our children. And this is the sort of quantity we're talking about, astronomical quantities. And it's going to start apparently almost immediately, start sucking the CO2 out, no, below zero, out to the end of the century and beyond, beyond the end of the century. And the net, the negative emission technology that dominates all of the models, and it's pretty much the only one that, I think it is the only one that's in the models, actually, is something called BECS. It's a whole sort of alphabet soup of acronyms in climate change, just to stop people understanding it, I think. Um, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. And then when you say this initially, you think, well, this sounds like it could work. You're going to grow trees and plants. They're going to absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. You're going to, going to harvest them, put them on ships, ship them all the way around the world. That bit's missing in all the models. Um, take it out, put it on trains, ship it to all the power stations, then burn it in the power stations. You're going to capture the CO2 going up the chimney. You're going to almost liquefy it as a sort of phase change state. Then you're going to pump it somewhere through some long pipelines deep underground and store it there for a few thousand years, probably under the sea. That's our plan for the rest of the century. This has never worked at scale. There are no examples of this working anywhere at scale on a power station. There are massive technological economic un unknowns. We don't even know how carbon capture and storage works. We have not got one power station that reliably works with carbon capture and storage. The only one we have is one in Canada. It's 110 megawatts, which is about the 40th the size of Jack's power station. And it's proved really problematic over the last two years. It only captured 40% of the CO2 they thought it would capture. So massive problems. I think probably as an engineer, it will be solved with a huge efficiency penalty. And there's limited biomass availability. Aviation wants it, shipping wants it, the chemical industry wants it. We've already got 5 to 7% in our cars. We want to feed 9 billion people. No. Oh, has it come back again? It's an it's a, a energy efficiency saving. It switches the batteries off on it. Um, <laughs> So we've got all, all these other people want biomass. It's the new silver bullet, is biomass. And it, another way to think about this, we put into the atmosphere, as I said before, about 40 billion tons of CO2 every year in our, by our behaviours. Um, and about half of that is captured by the oceans and by the plants. So about 20 billion tons is sort of natural, or this, it's absorbed by natural processes. The other half just builds up in the atmosphere, and hence our concentration of CO2 keeps going up. This technology that does not exist in the models, if you look at it, it broadly assumes we're going to, we're going to build a technology that will absorb between 10 and 20 billion tons every single year. In other words, about as much as the natural environment does today. So like bolting on another planet. Now, it's not as if one or two models do this. Virtually every single model that advises government does this. Not just our government, but all governments. Because if you don't do this, it's a bit challenging for people like us, and we won't vote the politicians back in. That's the belief. So we're all party to this collective delusion, all 7.5 billion of us. So Paris, some academics and policymakers, rather than focus on urgent and deep mitigation now, because that has challenging repercussions um, economically and politically, we're relying on non-existent, not we, our children are going to have to rely on non-existent technologies to suck the CO2 out of the air in huge quantities, 
This will support the ongoing fossil fuel industries, which in many of the scenarios is still operating in 2100. Nice, pays money into the Treasury, so everyone's pleased about that. And it also masks and the need for social change. And we're also pleased about that, because the last thing we want is people like us to have to change our lives. So this all fits really nicely with how, you know, how we'd like to see the future. If I go back to Richard Feynman. Yeah. Are we trying to fool nature? I think we are, we are completely trying to fool nature. Um, and we really know deep down that's exactly what we're trying to do. So let's take the scam out of it. And I, do, I normally have another slide in this. I do think we should research nets. I've taken that slide out for, for brevity reasons. So yes to researching nets, but no to assuming they work. So let's research them, develop them, and maybe even deploy them, the negative emission technologies. But let's not assume they work. Um, so I've taken out all the, all the maths behind this and some of the assumptions which you have to ask me about if you want to. I'm just trying to put out what are the headline messages that come out if you remove nets, negative emission technologies. Let's imagine first the poor parts of the world, which are dominated by China. Um, if they could reach a peak in their carbon dioxide emissions by the early 2020s, which is hugely challenging and much more than any literature, academic literature suggests is possible. Um, and then if they could ramp up their mitigation, the rates at which they reduce their emissions to 10% per annum within about 20 years. Now, if they grow and get 5% per annum in their economy, that's an improvement in their carbon intensity of 15% every single year. Um, we have no historical examples of this, but then we've never really tried. And the collapse of the Soviet Union was about 5% reduction every year. Um, that means they've got a fully decarbonized energy system sometime during the 2050. And what you can do, you can work out the carbon budget for that, for the poor parts of the world, and you can say, well, what's left for the wealthy parts of the world? And this, I particularly focus here on the wealthier countries rather than the OECD in total. So it's a bit lower than this for the OECD, but for wealthy countries like the UK, much of the EU, or at least quite a few of the major players in the EU, certainly the US, Japan, Australia, and so forth, this, is, this holds. We would need about 13% to 20% reduction in our emissions starting January the 1st of this year. So we're three weeks in, and so far we've failed. And remember, it's a cumulative problem. So every day you fail, it's much higher than the following day. That means about a 75% reduction in our emissions by 2025. So just think of our own lives. Could we reduce our emissions by 75% in the next few years? I think probably the answer is yes. Are we prepared to? I think probably the answer is no. That means we have to have a fully decarbonized energy system by about 2035 to 2040. And that's planes, ships, refrigerators, cars, industry, everything, zero carbon, by about 2035 to 2040. This is for a two degree centigrade, which anyway is very dangerous to many people in the world. But we've known this since 1990. And it would have been much easier if we'd started then. So that's the sort of all the depressing stuff out of the way. And um, now I'm going to try and say, is it possible? I'm just going to sort of touch on some headline work that myself and colleagues in the Tyndall Center at the University of Manchester and with other colleagues I work at in, within Sweden have been doing over a few years now. I think it's possible, just. But I think if I was asked to give this talk in five years' time, probably even in two or three years' time, I think, no, it's not. Um, but I think at the moment we could just hold on to this. And there are two things I want to look at. First on technology, on the demand side and the supply side. On, particularly on energy. I'm focusing here on energy. Agriculture and so forth is important, but my focus is on energy. Um, and then I'm going to touch on the behavioral side and the equity issue. The first thing to bear in mind that there are lots of low carbon energy supply options that we know how to do. We have been doing them for a long time. So whether you've got geothermal in Iceland, whether you've got offshore wind turbines, nuclear power stations. My dad used to work at this one in Sizewell. That's Sizewell A, the old Magnox and the PWR, Sizewell B in the background. Um, dams and solar panels. They're all, people may not like some of them for one reason or another, but they're all in the 5 to 15 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. They're all low. You've then got biomass, but I don't think biomass is really that low. There are lots of problems with N2O emissions from it and methane emissions. There are lots of sustainability implications, but it may have a role to play as an indigenous source for some things. Um, tidal energy, plenty in the UK if we're prepared to build it over the Severn Barrage. Wave energy, there are colleagues here working in Manchester on this, both of these actually in the, in, in the mechanic, School of Mechanical Aerospace and Civil Engineering. And then there's carbon capture and storage, which, of course, the oil companies love, and lots of people like geologists love it as well, generally. Um, but carbon capture and storage is not low carbon. That's when you capture the CO2 from a fossil fuel power station like gas or coal, and then you store it underground. But the actual emissions are probably about 100 to 200 grams per kilowatt hour, so very high emissions still. And they're not from the capture side. They're actually from the getting the fuel out the ground in the first place. Getting coal out the ground or gas is a high emission activity. So CCS will not be and never can be made very low carbon. So I think we have to recognize we cannot keep burning fossil fuels, um, despite the fact a lot of scientists rely on it in their analysis. 
Um, but what's worth bearing in mind is that all of those technologies are, are really electricity based. And electricity is only 20% of the energy we consume. 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity in the UK and most parts of the world. Even in France, 70% of what they consume is not electricity. So we therefore need a massive program of electrification. We currently consume, produce about 330, we consume about 330 terawatt hours of electricity. Our total energy consumption in the UK is about 1,800 terawatt hours there or thereabouts. So we need a grid that's probably three to five times as big as it is today and do that in the next 20 years. Now, there are massive demand opportunities here. I'm not going to go through these, and it's something I've spent a lot more time on. And it's not really in any of the models. They pretty much never touch demand. Um, you could have really tight efficiency standards and ramp them down year after year. Now, the, the financial directors will squeal, but the engineers will rub their hands and just deliver like they normally do, as long as it's within the laws of physics. So ignore the financial directors and listen to the engineers in this case. Um, and you just, normally, if you've got students out there, they've got their laptops out. I say, just look at your laptops. There'll be at least a 50 to 100% difference in the, few, in the energy consumption of the laptops that are out. Just look at cars. The average car on the road now is what, 147 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer. The average car being sold in the UK is 118, yet there's 400 model variants of cars that are well below 100 grams that are petrol and diesel cars. I know some people are scamming the tests. We know about that. Um, uh, if you look in the US, they're 212 grams per kilometer. So there's a huge difference. So there's massive opportunities for making changes at no cost, at just natural replacement cycles. This provides long-term market signals for industry. And I would argue if you, if you had, actually had governments and societies that thought climate change was important and did care about our children's future, then you probably could reduce emissions by 40 to 70% in 10 to 15 years. That's not going to solve the problem, but it's going to help you quite a long way on the way to it. And it helps you give a, extend the window of opportunity for building supply. The supply side is essential. But technology, supply and demand will not deliver Paris. It will not deliver two degrees centigrade. It cannot deliver in the time frames that we have. So the reliance on technology and economics is insufficient. It's a prerequisite, but insufficient. We need to look at the changes that, that we do, how often we do it, and um, which particular group it is. In other words, we need to unpick the romantic illusions, the bit that we don't want to go into. Um, at the global level, we find this massive asymmetry in emissions uh, and energy use. So globally, about 50% of all CO2 comes from only 10% of the world's population. Now, I guess even in this room, it will probably broadly hold to Pareto's rule. I bet if you looked at all the emissions here, it will come from 80% of those emissions will come from 20% of the people that are here. And I bet you can pretty much, if you looked at their income, you probably relate it quite closely to that. Or maybe the pensions, with some of you. Um, I haven't looked at the pensions. That's interesting. I have to think about them. Um, so... Yeah, and this has been shown repeatedly to be the sort of the case. Now, what I think is interesting, I did some basic calculations on this a couple of years ago, and I still find this number really quite surprising. If we, imagine, we, imagine we did care about our children's futures. I know it's a naive assumption, but let's imagine that for this moment we do. Then, then the top 10% of emitters reduce their carbon footprint to the level of the average European. Not too onerous. Well, it's not going to be enough, but it's not too onerous. You can imagine doing that. That's a one-third cut in global emissions just by the top 10% reducing the level of the average European. So there are huge opportunities to, work, to, to deliver on this almost overnight, if, you, if, we, if we did care about our children. Um, and the question then is, if that's true, we don't have to aim policies at 7.5 billion people. It's not about population this, not for 2 degrees centigrade. It's about consumption. The poor will not be rich enough in the time frame for 2 degrees centigrade to matter. So it's about the people who already consume. And they're not just in the wealthy parts of the world. They're also in some of the poor parts. Who's in the top 10% so we can tailor our policies towards them? So that makes it much easier. Well, the first group, climate scientists. We spend our time flying around the world telling the little people beneath us that they should cut their emissions. And quite a few of these climate scientists love to be in first or business class, as do quite a lot of academics. A pretense of care. Um, universities, we love foreign students, because we, they like to come over here, we can help them culturally and so forth, and they bring lots of money, of course. But we never think about the fact as well, that's fine, I think it's a good thing to do. But but how do they go backwards and forwards to their home countries? Do we have to rethink the scheduling of universities to reduce how often they go home? So they maybe they go home less often but for longer. What happens when they build up relationships if you're, if you're an Indian coming over here and meeting a Russian or a, you know, a Chinese person coming over here and meeting an Icelandic person and get relationships build up? You lock in high carbon, high energy futures. We need to think about that in universities. We are supposed to be places of cogency, not ignorance. So let us think about these issues in advance. Policymakers are in there, business leaders, audiences at climate change events. <laughs> yeah, we, all, we know who the 10% are because we see them when we shave and when we put our makeup on. They, they stare back from the mirror in, in reverse, of course. 
If you get on a plane once or twice a year, then we're definitely in that category. And I often say to the students, say, well, I'm not in that category. I say, why are you at university? You've come to university because it's good fun and you're going to get a good education. Why do you want a good education? I want a better job. Why do you want a better job? Well, I can earn more money. Why do you want more money? So I can get a bigger house, a larger car, fly business class, have a higher carbon footprint. So you've come to university to get a higher carbon footprint. And that's the way, remember, our society is at the moment. And that's why I'm saying this is not a small challenge. Because our whole system is embedded in that way of thinking. Equity frames the whole agenda differently. It's not about 7.5 billion people. It is for sustainability, but it's not for climate change, not in the 2 degrees C framework. It's about the people who already emit, with a few other people added to it. There's this massive asymmetry of responsibility. There is potential for rapid near-term reductions, at least as a start, by the top 10% of emitters. And there's a real opportunity for leading by example. So academics could be doing that, but anyone can do this to start off with. You know, do it yourself, be vociferous about it, talk to your neighbours, discuss with the people you're having you meet in the sports clubs or your bridge clubs, whatever you do. Um, our universities could be doing that. Universities are completely abdicated any responsibility for climate change. There's lots of lip service, the odd climate change committee and so forth, but no university is showing any leadership on this at the moment. We're even reluctant to divest from most universities. So imagine the universities start to demonstrate examples. Then all the universities in the UK were doing it. It'd be very hard for the policymakers to ignore them. All our universities are saying climate change is important. At the moment, we don't say that at all. We could catalyze system change, which allows government to start putting regulations in that change the system. So it's not, individuals, don't, individuals are important here in that they trigger the catalyst that allows us to regulate. So regulation ultimately where it comes to. But we have left it so late, we, our choice has been to leave climate change so late, that it now demands system change. If we interpret um, Paris through the, budget, through the logic of carbon budgets and, um, and rather than astrology, then it's going to have fundamental questions in our norms and our paradigms. It's going to really require things like a Marshall-style reconstruction of our energy system. So like the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War. Um, you know, it's a bit like Roosevelt going into the, into the Ford saying, I need you to build you know, tanks and, and planes. And they said, we can't be building cars. And so you don't understand, you won't be building cars. That's the sorts of you know, shift we need in our productive capacity. You're not going to be building Lamborghinis and Land Rovers because you're going to be making trams and wind turbine blades. So if we're serious about climate change, there's that agenda. It's a massive jobs agenda. I think you could reconstruct this in a way that it makes it very politically appealing. It's not maybe uh, the effect on GDP might be different. Um, rapid penetration from inefficient to efficient appliances, profound shifts in behaviors by people like me, development of economic models that are fit for purpose. We currently just use this marginal economic models which are just completely market models. They're great about competing sock companies on the high street, but at system level issues, at a global level, they have nothing to say about it. And those of you who have done any sort of fluid dynamics, and I know some of you have, you would never dream of using laminar flow to understand turbulent flow. So why do we use um, marginal, small scale economics to understand large scale system changes? No other discipline would do this, only economics, the dismal discipline. Um, we need, and there are other forms of it, ecological economics, they can help us with system change. We need some serious consideration of our own children's future and those elsewhere in the world. And we need to have reparation, not aid, for the poor parts of the world. Because we've forced them to we've imposed upon them climate change that will get worse and worse. And we've asked them not to use fossil fuels like we have to get to the position we're in today. So we, we need reparation compensation for the global south. All this needs to start now and be completed in about three decades, which is an academic is great because we haven't got a clue what to do. So we've got a blank piece of paper and we've got a really exciting challenge. So, academically, this is a time of, it should be, if we could get some funding for it, it would be a time of significant interest. Um, but we know where to find the solutions. We know sort of where they are. And they're not in a utopian alliance of technology and economics. Yeah, you know, technology and economics, he says slightly reluctantly, and they do have a role to play. But no sort of utopian vision of it. Many of the solutions, and even the technical solutions, actually have a significant romantic dimension to them. They're wrapped up in the box we dare not open called romantic illusions, the difficult things that we have to deal with if we're going to solve climate change. Our choice, ultimately, is between a short-term real politique, which I always get told, oh, we've got to fit with the current orthodoxy, or long-term real climate. And I think the climate will win out every single time. Remember, modern human societies have only ever seen one degree C of variation in temperature for the last 10,000 years. We have not lived through more than one degree in the last 10,000 years. Only if you go much further back, you see high temperatures. So we, we're living now, in a, in a, we're already now living in a temperature we have not seen since sort of modern humans started to devolve. And I'm going to finish off with this quote from Robert Unger, that at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. 
The future will be radically different, either because we've had the, um, the integrity and, 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 uh, and sense to make the changes necessary, or it will be different because we've carried on with a hedonistic use of carbon and we'll be hit by climate change. But universities are places where we should be awash with imagination. We should be thinking what different futures are out there that are prosperous, sustainable, and low carbon. If that's not enough. We then have to provide clarity to policymakers and others as what would you need to do to deliver that? And that's our job in universities. I think at the moment we're just touching it, and most of the time we're probably pretending it's, it's not a big issue. But on that upbeat note, thank you for listening. Great, as always. Okay, um, I'm going to take a somewhat different focus than, uh, than Kevin. Kevin's been giving you the global picture. Uh, coming from, uh, fr from a strong science background, I'm actually going to focus on a case study. I'm going to look at, at Bangladesh and particularly look at the way in which Bangladesh is confronting climate change. And the main message that I've got is that we definitely, many of us need to rethink the way that we understand in which poorer parts of the world, uh, which are experiencing climate change, what their position is. And quite often they're seen as victims waiting for people from the rich world, scientists or financiers to come and rescue them. And what I'll point out here is that uh, in Bangladesh, people are very active, whether it's the intellectually, the scientists in Bangladesh, or whether you go down to village level. People are very actively adapting because they have no choice but to adapt to climate change because it's already hitting them in Bangladesh and they are adapting their lives and they're getting very little support uh, from those of us who come from wealthier nations. They get lots of promises, they got lots of complicated documents about how finance will be delivered to them, but they don't actually get much of the finance and the forms of advice and support uh, which they could find most useful. I mean, I'm referring to work that we've been doing at our Global Development Institute, particularly with colleagues Manoj Roy and uh, Joe Hanlon here. Um, the IPCC, which we've been hearing about already, predicts that climate change will make the environment in Bangladesh much harsher than it is at present. It's known as a difficult environment uh, to live in. It has a large number of challenges, but it will change in a number of ways. Uh, there are clear predictions and clear signs that the cyclones are getting stronger. They're not increasing in number as had been thought might be the case, but they are actually blowing harder. The surges are getting higher uh, of the waves. The wind speeds are, are getting higher. Uh, there's increased and more intense rainfall. And in Bangladesh, there's lots of rainfall, and it's very intense. I've been working in Bangladesh for almost 30 years now, but it does seem to be regularly now actually coming down even faster for even longer, even harder. Increased uh, river flooding, partly because of the rainfall, partly because of the melting glaciers in the Himalayas, uh, pumping more, uh, more water through, and sea level rise um, is occurring, but is likely to occur at a much faster rate in the future. Um, in the book we go in in detail, but we posed the question early on, can Bangladesh cope? Can it adapt so that it can provide its citizens with a reasonable and improving level of life compared to what they've got at the moment? And we think that certainly, I mean, despite the problems that are occurring, up to the middle of this century, it looks like Bangladesh can cope. It will not dramatically reduce uh, living standards. It will not lead to, in a way, much greater increases in mortality uh, rates. But there is going to be a high cost, a high economic cost, a lot more uh, expenditure that Bangladeshis are having to make, a lot more work that they're having um, to do. But after that, then what really counts is, uh, in a way, are the carbon budgets that, uh, that Kevin's been talking about. In the book, we use these crude terms, which are more common, which is looking at uh, the degree, the average degree of global warming. 1.5% uh, uh, increase in, uh, in global temperatures that talked about, that would mean that global warming peaks around about 2050, 2060, and Bangladesh probably could uh, adopt to that. But we're already at 1.1, 1.2, um, so <laughs> achieving 1.5 is going to require the sorts of miracles, multiple miracles that uh, Kevin was pointing out. If we go to the two degrees uh, Celsius, the one which policymakers still tend to uh, fixate on, then global warming peaks around uh, 2010. Um, 
Bangladesh, we think, could cope, but the costs will be incredibly high. The opportunities to improve people's living standards, to improve livelihoods, to make them more stable and more secure, uh, to invest in infrastructure that people could use to improve their lives in health and education systems will not be able to be uh, spent because lots of that resource will have to go into uh, adapting to the climate, uh, to climate change. If we look at the sort of what's been promised at Paris, 2.7 degrees Celsius certainly is one of the lower estimates of if the sort forms of promises or half promises that were made there were honoured, then we're looking in a way at parts of major parts of Bangladesh disappearing underwater, much more intense problems with cyclones, uh, with flooding, and really uh, potentially a massive reduction in the quality of life for Bangladeshis imposed by those of us, particularly in the rich world, those of us who are rich, that top 10%, who are creating these problems and not at the moment prepared to mitigate them. Now, Bangladesh is usually seen in a way as a country which is um, a victim of climate change and which needs the West, uh, people from OECD or rich nations, to give them the technologies, give them the advice, give them the finance uh, that they need. But that's not the case. Bangladeshi scientists have actually been working on climate change for 30 years and leading many aspects of it. Back in 1987, the Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies was set up, which immediately began to concentrate on climate change. Back in 1990, when the first IPCC report was published, well, Bangladeshi scientists produced a book called Climate Change in Bangladesh, which looked at the different ways in which climate change would impact on Bangladesh. And so Bangladeshi scientists have been actively looking at what's happening in the country and actively feeding ideas into the international um, system. Um, but they know what's, what's coming. They know they've got to engage with these international negotiations to curb uh, greenhouse gases, um, and they know that the present agreements um, talk about two degrees Celsius are not enough, but they also know there's got to be a focus on adaptation, and they're doing lots of work to look at how they could adapt to a world in which the, the climate uh, is, is changing. It is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world, um, but it certainly refuses to be a helpless victim. And so we say the scientists are working, but also at the local level people are working. If we look at, the, at that upper level, then um, Bangladeshi scientists have taken a lead and, uh, in the least developed countries, the 48 least developed countries in the world, and have been providing advice and guidance and mobilizing those countries so that they do much more effectively demand that mitigation should occur and that adaptation costs should actually be covered uh, through the sorts of, of uh, well, uh, in a way by the rich nations recognizing that they have imposed costs um, on Bangladesh. They um, have set up the Climate Vulnerable Forum, a group of nations that are particularly vulnerable to climate change, and the V20, the 20 nations which are most vulnerable to climate change. And they meet on a regular basis and point out, it sort of mirrors the G20 idea. These are not the 20 richest nations in the world. These are the 20 most climate vulnerable nations in the world. And this gives them a voice to say what is happening because of climate change and what um, should be done. They've used their own uh, expertise to adapt to climate change. I'll talk to one of those uh, examples uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a minute. But let's also take a look then at the local level. At the local level, people are also adapting to climate change. And here you can see um, an area of Bangladesh which is flooded. Uh, this is not unusual in Bangladesh. Bangladeshis have lots of knowledge about flooding and how to deal with flooding. And we can see some of these um, occurring here, but also think about some of the changes that occur as the floods get deeper, as the floods get more uh, frequent. If you look at the house on the left-hand side, you can see it's actually raised. It's on a plinth and then the floor has been raised, and that's because people expect to flood every year, and so they've built the house above the floods. Um, the problem, of course, for this lady and her family is going to be if the floods get more intense and rise more, then she is going to have to pay <laughs> to get her house raised, to have a higher floor there. We can see if we look here, this is a 
a water pump. And maybe you can see the problem that's going to happen with the water pump. It's already happening here because of the height of the water, but you can't use this water pump. This water pump needs to be put on a raised concrete stand so that you could continue to use it uh, during periods of flooding. The same with toilets, and toilets in Bangladesh are often built actually on raised stands so that you can actually use the toilet, uh, try and keep the, uh, the fecal materials in the toilet, in, in, in the sanitation system, in the, in the septic tank uh, during that period. And these, uh, you, that's gonna have to be raised. Will this woman have to pay for that to be raised or will somebody else recognize that the floods are getting higher because of people flying around the world using carbon air excessively in that. And actually you can see this woman, one of the adaptations that she's made, is she's actually paddling um, off in her canoe to somewhere where there is a way, raised water pipe so that she can get uh, clean water. So these, in a way, adaptations, this knowledge is being created at elite levels by Bangladeshi scientists, but also at the local level where people who are used to coping with a difficult environment are adapting what they do so they can cope with an even more difficult um, environment. Just to quickly sort of paint out and uh, move on to sort of you know, some of the opportunities, some of the challenges in Bangladesh. And the starting point has to be that you know, Bangladesh is a living uh, delta. It's both a very difficult environment because it floods and has cyclones, but it's also a very good environment because it has fertile soils which are well watered where you can grow crops pretty um, intensively. You've got enormous amounts of water that come down uh, from the Himalayas and flood the countries, uh, flood the country uh, in late spring and the, months and the rains that come in uh, in August and September and October in particular. And so you've got massive amounts of water that's crossing the country, but there's also a lot of uh, soil and sediment uh, which has created the delta and which continues to create the delta. And it's round about a billion tons a year of sediment are coming down from the Himalayas um, and I mean, have created the delta and continue to create um, and reshape it. It creates this rich um, farmland, but as I've said, there are many problems. A particular problem is erosion. And when you get the floods, then the riverbanks are eroded and the people who have farms on the edges of the riverbanks lose those farms, lose their livelihood, uh, but you also get new islands created. Uh, so one can look at how one takes advantage of those. Uh, round about every, uh, every decade, there is a catastrophic flood, uh, and that creates problems. And there are also annual cyclones and sometimes super cyclones every 10 to 15 uh, years. About a third of Bangladesh is uh, less than three meters above sea level. So certainly if one looks at any of the scenarios that see the ice sheets of Greenland melting, then if they do melt, round about one third of Bangladesh will disappear pretty uh, quickly. Bangladesh is often perceived still to be a basket case, but actually it's had a, a very successful 25, 30 years. It is actually a development uh, success. At independence in 1971, after what is uh, believed by many to have been a, a genocide, uh, after a famine, then Kissinger, an aide to, to Kissinger, called it a basket case and said it would be a permanent basket case. But Bangladeshis have certainly ensured that that is not the case. It now feeds itself. Its health standards are better than the health standards of India. And its fertility rate has come down from seven live births per woman to 2.2 live births per woman over a 25-year period, one of the fastest reductions in fertility rates uh, that's ever been seen. Uh, a whole set of often contested arguments about how Bangladesh has managed to advance so quickly. Certainly economic growth is a major part of that, around about 6% economic growth over 20 years that most of you are probably wearing clothing, uh, part of your clothing which comes from, from Bangladesh. Bangladesh has managed to, uh, to industrialize very effectively. Education, there are real problems with education, but education has spread across the population so that almost all of the population is getting into primary school now, and especially for girls. At the primary school level, there are now more girls in school than there are boys, which for many people, if they look back 25 years ago, that was unimaginable, but there's been a push to get girls into school and for gender empowerment, and that's worked. But there's also research, um, actually local level, uh, lo local research by Bangladeshi agriculturists produced the improved borrow rice, which has certainly added greatly to uh, the country's capacity to be able to feed itself, to have its own mini green 
revolution. If you're really looking for a headline to show you how well Bangladesh is doing, then cyclone deaths are down by 99% over the last 30, uh, 40 years. If we go back to 1970, just before independence, when there was a terrible super cyclone, then the estimate is that half a million people drowned or died immediately uh, after that. There were deaths because of the breakdown in health services, but certainly half a million uh, died pretty much immediately. Go to 1991, it's appalling, but it is down uh, to 138,000. But when one goes to 2007, the most recent super cyclone, then the estimate is 3,300 people dead. It's still an appallingly big figure, but this is almost 99% down on what would have been expected uh, back in 1970. Um, in the USA, if they'd have been able to reduce the effects of cyclones so effectively, then you wouldn't have had Katrina. The Bangladeshis had been managing Katrina, you wouldn't have seen the appalling things that happened in New Orleans because the Bangladeshis have certainly found ways of dealing with cyclones and with these super cyclones. Shelters, and they have shelters so that people can shelter from the cyclones so they don't get drowned. A very effective early warning system. 50,000 uh, volunteers going out to get people to move into the shelters to think about uh, a few hours, two, three, four hours before the cyclone hits, about how they can ensure that they uh, survive. Most recent cyclone, uh, Ruanu, in 2016, over half a million people went into the shelters. This is what the shelters um, are like. They're basically used as schools or local government offices most of the time, but once the cyclone is coming, then they're used as emergency shelters where people can go to, and if they get onto these, they should be able to survive. They won't be washed away. Their houses may be washed away, their animals may be washed away, but they will be able to, uh, to survive in these. What happens is the Bangladesh Meteorological Organization, two to three days beforehand, begins to warn people that it looks like a cyclone or a super cyclone is going to hit. Around about 12 hours beforehand, then they've been very effectively estimating which part of the coast the cyclone uh, will hit and at that stage 40, 50,000 volunteers are mobilized to go village to village, house to house saying batten down, get whatever valuables you can carry and get to the, uh, get, get to the shelter as soon um, as you can do and that's really helped uh, to, to, to bring down the appalling rate that used to happen. So these are working well but there's only 500 of them in the country at the moment. They are incredibly densely packed when, uh, when, when cyclones um, occur, and they're going to have to be adapted. Um, the country needs about 500 more, and the flood waves are now six to seven meters, not the four and a half to five and a half meters that these were planned on. And so we actually need stronger buildings, and we need 500 more of them. And when Western nations are saying it's difficult to negotiate with the government of Bangladesh about how we might adapt to climate change. Well, build 500 of these. Um, that would be a, a very effective uh, use. I have been giving you the sort of the positive side of Bangladesh, but actually at the Global Development Institute, we've also been looking at climate change in urban areas. And we are very concerned about climate change in the mega cities, particularly in Dhaka um, and in Chittagong. Um, in theory, the the cities have building regulations and regulations about infrastructure, but they're hardly ever enforced. And particularly when you look at the busties, as they're called, the informal settlements, what many people would call slums, then one finds that there are really no building standards and the degree of planning that's occurring uh, is very limited to actually deal with climate change. Depending on where you are, 45 to 70 percent of the population is in these informal settlements. So the work that we've been doing has been trying to help the Bangladeshi government become more aware that it needs also to think particularly about the, these low-income settlements where the poorer people live, which are much more vulnerable to flooding, much more vulnerable to cyclones, and look at ways that they could actually help people uh, in those areas cope much more. With cyclones, this is very important. Uh, in most of these low-income settlements, people have got sort of very cheap uh, iron roofs nailed down. When you get a cyclone hitting those, the roofs come off and you get those large pieces of spinning iron which decapitate people and chop them and cause an, an enormous amount of damage. And so there are ways that one could think if one could bring very simple standards in that one could make a whole set of, uh, 
of what used to be, uh, well, of climate-caused events that are becoming more and more severe, how one might manage uh, those better in urban areas. And let's move back to rural areas where we can show that certainly Bangladeshi scientists and the Bangladeshi uh, government, which, uh, which has many problems, have been more effective. And basically, what Bangladeshi scientists are looking at in particular is whether they could raise the land to match sea level rise. And in a way, there is an assumption that as sea level rises, then the land disappears. But actually, if you could get the land <laughs> to rise, then you would be able to keep the land uh, above the sea level. If you've got a billion tons of sediment, then if you could manage that sediment in effective ways, you could help to adapt the environment in quite a massive way so that the rise in sea level uh, does not become so uh, disastrous. Um, and certainly, uh, people looking at... Uh, at, at at land levels, at the hydrology of Bangladesh, uh, are able to observe that land has often remained at the same level despite the fact that it should have been compacted by agriculture, by erosion from wind, by the large weights of water that have laid on top of it, but actually that it's managed to maintain its height. And this is somewhat counterintuitively, not initially due to the sediment being washed down, but it's actually due to, in the dry season, the pushing of sediment from the sea back inland and actually the potential to use that. So it's not, not necessarily capturing the sediment as it goes down in the monsoon, but it's trying to manage the tidal inflows that move 200, 300 kilometers inland so that you can actually get the, uh, the land rising. I better keep on moving. What's been tried in the past are dikes and polders. The US government put a lot of money, paid a lot of US engineering companies a lot of money to uh, build dikes and polders on a Dutch system. But these, uh, built in the 1960s, nearly 1970s, have failed. This is actually um, a repair, but a cyclone simply ripped through. These, in a way, uh, dikes and polders were to keep the cyclones out, but they've failed to do that. But they've also created problems because quite often they actually retain the monsoon water at very, uh, at very high levels so that you get the water logging, so that agriculture is less productive, um, and so that you get a whole set of other environmental uh, problems. And so simply transferring, paying U.S. engineers to bring Dutch technologies uh, to Bangladesh has not worked. What is working in some areas, and Bangladeshi scientists are working on in collaboration with scientists from other parts of the world now, is going to tidal river management and trying to work out how in the dry season these inflows that can bring large amounts of sediment back, how that can be uh, captured. This is looking at historic systems and how they might be adapted, but if you go back to the Mughal times, then quite often the fields and the soil was replenished by capturing uh, the, the sediment that came back in. Um, in the 1980s, people uh, living in areas where we had these US-built polders began to actually cut the embankments um, and began to actually return to indigenous systems of water management. And certainly in one area, it was demonstrated that actually they got the land to rise 1.5 meters over a two-year period. And so there's now a series of experiments to look at tidal river management to see if these systems would work better. But quite often, these systems would require that for certainly three years in every 30 years, you can't grow any crops because <laughs> The land is flooded and or you make it too saline and need to flush it out again. Um, and again, if we look at, if we had Bangladesh actually trying to raise the land so it doesn't suffer the problems of climate change, then maybe we should ask who should pay. At the moment, it seems to be mainly uh, the Bangladeshis. The Bangladeshis did not cause uh, global warming. Average Bangladeshi uh, produces about 5% of the emissions of the average EU uh, citizen, but they know what's happening. Uh, they're already spending uh, around $1 billion a year on adaptation to climate change. Three quarters of that is Bangladeshi money from individuals or from the government. Much of the rest is World Bank loans, so it's got to be uh, repaid. We keep getting these promises that there's going to be climate change adaptation funds, but actually at the moment, the stronger shelters, the research and raising the land are very much dependent on Bangladeshi uh, resources. 
The UK and certainly Gordon Brown tried to do the right thing back in 2008 when he became Prime Minister. He pledged 75 million immediately and another 75 million for climate change adaptation in Bangladesh. But by 2016, only 61 million pounds had been dispersed. There were great debates about why that disbursement had, why the 150 million hadn't been achieved with certainly uh, people responsible from the British government saying the Bangladeshi government is not doing what we want, but the Bangladeshi is saying no. <laughs> The, these funds were to be managed by the World Bank and it was imposing a whole set of high cost conditions and foreign consultants on the country. And so we argue certainly in the book that the FID in the UK, the World Bank, need to increasingly begin to trust the government of Bangladesh to work out how they can work with Bangladeshi scientists and how they could actually uh, use the sorts of resources that are promising. The uh, Green Climate Fund, which in Bangladesh is managed by the UN, has been much more successful in managing to get uh, money out reasonably uh, quickly. And so finally, um, the message of the book is to listen to Bangladesh and listen to Bangladeshis. Don't see the country as a victim waiting for rich countries to come and help it, but actually help the Bangladeshis help themselves build on the things which the people of Bangladesh, the scientists of Bangladesh, and the governments of Bangladesh are doing. Um, we need to mitigate, we need to curb global warming in the ways that, uh, that, that Kevin's uh, been talking about, and obviously with Donald uh, Trump and this, uh, this is proving difficult, but we can also look at the way that we can uh, finance the cyclone shelters, the flood protection, raising the land, improving the crops. At the moment, it's Bangladeshis who are paying for that, um, and it's outside the Zussi themselves as having a right to decide. We argue, no, we need to work much more closely with the scientists at the elite level, with the villagers and with the slum dwellers at the local level so that we can support adaptation and help Bangladesh uh, uh, more effectively uh, reduce the problems which we've created. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, we have time uh, for a few questions uh, for David and Kevin, so we have some roving uh, mics as well. So could I, uh, and do you have any questions? Yeah, it's really nice. Okay, uh, well, the, the first point is talking about something called climate sensitivity, which some of you may know about and some of you may not. That's basically what will the temperature rise be for a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's called the climate sensitivity. And there have been papers repeatedly published on this. It's a, it's a real sort of uh, major issue in climate change for a long time now. And um, so w the IPCC used quite a long range, quite a wide range. I can't remember the latest numbers. It's something like 1.5 to 1.7 degrees, up to about 4 or 4.5 degrees, I think, for doubling in carbon dioxide levels. And the, the, the best guess from the scientists is that it's about 3 degrees. So the IPCC typically uses about a 3 degrees C of warming if we double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere compared to the pre-industrial periods. So, uh, yes, governments do. Governments already are starting to use papers like that one or the recent paper by Miller and Miles and others that say it's not quite so severe. They tend to not bother with all the numerous papers that say it looks like it's much worse. So there are lots of papers suggesting it's lots worse. There are some papers suggesting it could be better, um, and people tend to err uh, towards the ones that make it a little bit better. Um, that, that's the process of science. 
Um, and I think, I think the IPCC in working group one have captured that quite well. The issue about economists is just simply, I mean, it's very easy for me to slate economists, and I've spent quite a lot of time engaging with them and, and did quite a lot of economic work in my PhD years ago. I just think that they have a role in some things in society, looking at competitive models and so forth, that are appropriate for, say, for high street type activities. But I think that sort of model which is now used for system level issues is completely inappropriate. But economics has a whole set of tools and approaches that it's been using for a long time that are more appropriate in political economy, in the more modern forms of ecological economics. So I think we can't dismiss all of the economics profession. I just think the ones that dominate at the moment tend to be ones that do not have the skill set or the tools that can deal with the scale of the challenge that we're facing. universities in this country and uh, he has done a lot of work on sea level changes in Bangladesh. Amazingly he's also a climate change denier and he, his thesis is that we've been here before and uh, there's lots of evidence to show that we have been here before. Um, I've given up trying to argue with him <laughs> but is there any chance that he might be right? Um, Kevin will know the science for sure. I mean, we've been here before, but not, 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 not when there were 150, 140 million uh, Bangladeshis in such a vulnerable position. I think the time when we were here before is probably pre-human, or certainly if it was during the human experience, it would be when there were a few hundred thousand people living in the Delta, not 140, 150 in vast urban agglomerations as well as in very dense uh, rural settlements. So even if environmentally we've been even before, not with this population on the edge of the cyclones with the glaciers melting in the Himalayas. And that's certainly, it's, it's this vast population which is adapting. Uh, I, I, yeah, we haven't been there before. On the denial side, I'm quite surprised really if it was a scientist because virtually all the scientists that were deniers are not deniers anymore. And, and there's some really good evidence to show how they've shifted their position. So they might initially say there's nothing to do, the climate change doesn't exist. Then they might say, yes, it does exist, but it's not human, it's not related to CO2. And then what you see is a shift. Now they generally the accepted view by most skeptics, including the Global Warming Policy Foundation, even you know, people like Lord Moncton and, and um, Lawson and others, would say, and Matt Ridley, they would say, yes, climate change exists. It is exacerbated by, significantly by human emissions of carbon dioxide, burning from fossil fuels in particular. Well, their argument would be actually the economic implications are not going to be so severe and we're able to deal with them. And I'm not sure who I mean by we when they say that. Probably mean people like us can deal with it. Um, so I'm very surprised if a scientist is still just denying climate change and denying a link to CO2. Um, yeah, I, I might have to go back and look at their research in the past and you know, revisit that as to whether it was valid or not. I mean, in Bangladesh, those changes in agriculture are occurring. People are having to adapt to it. And in a way, one of the problems I, I talked about, the, the neglect as we see it in, in, in government policy and public action on what's happening in urban areas, and certainly in Bangladesh, there's been a real concentration on food security and climate change. And there's been a, a lot of good Bangladeshi and international science going on into planting different varieties, planting on different dates, Running, managing water systems in, in, in different ways. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's been working reasonably well, but again, quite a lot of those costs are absorbed by Bangladeshis. They're going into dealing with the problem that we've created because you can't use the varieties that you would have used, you can't plant on the days you would have done. But uh, agriculture probably, agricultural emissions probably represent something like 20% of the warming that we've seen. So they're, they're a significant part of the problem. Most of the emissions are not carbon dioxide related. They're normally methane emissions, which are relatively short-lived, about 20 years. 
um, or 10 to 20 years in the atmosphere before it breaks down. Um, uh, but it has, a, it has a higher potency during that time than carbon dioxide, and also nitrous oxide, N2O emissions, which last a long time. So fertilizers and so forth, whether it's organic fertilizers or, not, or synthetic fertilizers, they pretty much always have an N2O emission issue. So that's, that's a big issue. Um, there are lots of things that can be done to reduce emissions from agriculture, but they cannot be eliminated. Unlike energy, where you can eliminate the emissions from energy, you cannot eliminate emissions from agriculture. You will always get some methane, and you almost certainly get some nitrous oxide emissions. Um, reducing the meat use, particularly red meats, makes a very big difference. So if we can shift away from um, um, significant quantities of meat into our diet to the much lower levels of meat, whether they're vegetarian or just eat a lot less meat, that can be really beneficial. Um, and we, it's interesting when you see, I mean, it's not near our work on agriculture, but my understanding is if you look at somewhere like China, as it's got very much richer, they eat a lot more meat. But that's not been the case in India, that's got a lot richer. So there are cultural dimensions to food which make it a much more interesting subject and a much more complicated subject. Um, there aren't the same degree of cultural dimensions to energy as there are to food, but there are plenty of things that we can do, but we will not be able to eliminate them. And that's why we have to look at other things like um, uh, refo forest restoration, reforestation, um, and so forth, that might be able to compensate for some of the warming that we get from ongoing agricultural practices. I think here you have to tailor, I don't, as an academic, I think I just have to, you know, I use the language I do and, and say it bluntly, but nevertheless, I do tailor my presentations and the language that I use a little bit to the audiences, and it depends a bit on who you're speaking to, as to whether that breakdown would be an appropriate language. Sometimes some psychologist friends of mine who I work with on climate change would argue the language of breakdown puts people off, turns them off, they think there's no hope, so why try? Other people find it really inspiring, and they go out and they feel I've got to do even more. So I think you have to, the, the language itself, um, is something we have to be very careful about how we use it. It has to be appropriate. And I certainly think you could argue in some areas that we're looking like we're heading towards climate breakdown in terms of um, the period of time that humans have been developing significantly on the planet. Yes, it looks like we've not seen anything above one degree C of warming before. We're now at 400 parts per million by volume of carbon dioxide, which we haven't seen for somewhere between about 800,000 years and 15 million years. Um, we've seen sea level rise go up by 20 centimetres by the end of the century. It's probably going to be about a metre, maybe even a metre and a half. But it, um, probably by 2050, we'll be seeing, well, I think probably 2030 to 2035, we'll see one and a half degrees. By 2050, we could be heading as much as two, depending what else else happens, certainly not long after 2050. And once we get to about two, you're pretty much guaranteed to melt Greenland. And you can't reverse it, apparently, so I've been told. And when you melt Greenland, the seven metres of sea level rise. That will not melt in this century, though. That will melt probably over three, four, five, six centuries. But then you have locked in seven meters. So if you start to think what we're doing now is creating a breakdown in the climate system in such a way that it will have repercussions over quite a number of centuries, I think that is an accurate account. I think if we see, we're not, I would say most scientists would not expect to see that level of change occurring across the century. But significant nonetheless, a meter, meter and a half is a lot of sea level rise. Um, and all the other repercussions that go with that, particularly things like heat waves and so forth. But we could be wrong. It could be much worse, or of course it could be a little bit better. So um, I think we should be a bit more precautionary about it. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, a woman. Um, do you think ecosystem services approach is a good way of embedding environmental considerations into forestry planning, or does it just pop up a system? <sighs> Um, does an ecosystem service approach uh, embed environmental considerations in a meaningful way into uh, policy making and planning, or does it just prop up a disastrous system? Um, well, let's say that those of us who work on, on, on development, it probably depends whether you're an economist or not, but I mean, there's, there's been great debates about whether this instrumentalizes our ideas of, of what the environment and nature are, and so, yeah, we can accept the loss of species, the loss of old landscapes, and that because we can look at it simply in terms of placing uh, valuations. Um, on it. In terms of the work that certainly we've been doing in, in urban Bangladesh, then we're finding the ecosystem services quite useful because certainly there hasn't been a, a lot of 
thinking in a way about the way that, uh, that flooding actually flushes out um, much of the fecal material and the, the ways in which that you know, could be used to better effect rather than to spreading it round and that and, and trying to th think about those flows and how those flows might be better managed. Um, and that may mean changing something in rural areas so that the flows into Dakar and Chittagong uh, are, are operating differently. So it certainly sometimes offers insights, but there's certainly a, a large literature, particularly on the conservation side in, in development studies, that says, no, no, this instrumentalizes everything and uh, fails to recognize the rights of species. Um, and, uh, a couple of things here. For, for those of you who aren't aware of ecosystem services, it's the idea of thinking, what, what are the services that ecosystems provide us as humans in our sort of day-to-day -day life, like the pollination of crops for our agriculture, for instance, and lots of other things, like keeping the air clean with with trees or with transvaporation during heat waves. So yeah, some, there's this idea they provide services for us, and if we can see that, then we start to value them differently. Um, it depends on how you, how you think society values things. I think for people like me, I don't, I'm not interested in the ecosystem services approach, but to some other people, they might find it appealing. So again, it's a sort of language issue to some extent. My major concern is when we start to put values on it. We don't put values on it. What we put on is a price, and a price has no relation to value. You cannot value an ecosystem service. And no doubt some economists will tell you they'll do it for us. And they did it quite, I have colleagues that do this actually. And I had one that did it some years ago for, for DEFRA, and he put a, a value on the price of pollinating insects in the UK. But the value he used was roughly the same as the discredited chair from RBS in their, their salary. So are we saying that the benefit from, because remember, as soon as you've done this in economics, then you can, sub, the point about in economics and the benefit of it is that once you've got a value, you can substitute. You can substitute, the, you know, car parks worth a million pounds for forests worth a million pounds. They're both worth a million pounds. So once they've got a value, you can substitute. So what we said there was an RBS chair is worth as much as pollinating in insects. Or you could argue that actually the value they've got for pollinating insects is roughly twice the level of that we're going to pay that new football player that's going to join Manchester United. So do we really think that, that fo two football players from Man United are worth as much as all the benefits from pollinating insects in our agriculture? No one thinks that, except for economists. Um, so, so the problem with that valuation approach is that if you're going to use it from the way it's supposed to be used, it gives you these completely bizarre outcomes. The reason people use it is because they sort of, like Defra said, quite reasonably, I knew the chief scientist at the time, said, if we can put a value on it, we can tell, it's important, tell the treasury it's important. But it's not a value, it's just a price. Um, I, I rather just be more honest and have greater integrity and say, yes, pollinating insects are much more important than football players or bankers. And therefore, we just we can make rules on that basis. I don't think we need spurious metrics to decide another important decision. Like, I don't particularly like ref or impact cases either. But anyway, that's another issue. Um, so, so I think it's, a, it's an unnecessary metric, but I think the our concept of ecosystem services may be beneficial sometimes, but not the valuation. Uh, just wait to tell you about two more events coming up. We have on the 8th of March, 